In the last lesson, we talked about the uh, effects of earthquakes and the damage that's caused and the death and destruction. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is how we can reduce um, all those consequences. And it's about earthquake management. What can we do before the earthquake? What can we do during the earthquake? And what can we do after earthquakes? So we get buildings like this that move around, but don't necessarily fall down and cause lots of damage. Building strong buildings will be just one part of what we call hazard management. This is where you're not only reducing the impacts, but you also need to identify and analyse how to, to solve the problems of the hazard. And there are four ways in which we can manage a hazard. Those four stages are prediction, preparation, response and appraisal or also what we call long-term planning. Once we've had an event and we got to this appraisal long-term planning stage, that will then be where we decide was the response good enough? So we might go back and change the response, make that better. We might realise that we need to pre prepare better and also predict. So it's an ongoing process. It's not like you manage once for a hazard, but it's continually being updated and improved. The first stage we need to look at in managing um, hazards is prediction. This is knowing that a hazard like an earthquake is shortly about to happen. This focuses on where is the hazard going to happen and when is it going to happen. So when we look at earthquakes, we know roughly where they're going to happen because of plate tectonics. So that gives us a reasonably good idea. But with the when, this is slightly more unpredictable. And this is because plates... Uh, such as these vast things that we don't necessarily know when they're going to move. And therefore, because of that, when, when it comes to the when, it is slight, it's less accurate. That can be very hard to get correct. However, we do use um, uh, prediction devices. So if you look on the left here, um, what I've circled is what we call a seismometer, which we've talked about in pre previous lessons. And this is where it is tracking the movement of the earth. And if we get a big movement, then it draws these big wavy lines here on that seismograph. And therefore, we know an earthquake is about to happen. On the, in the top picture, which is a picture of Japan, we can see that lots of these dots, these are all the stations of the, of the seismometers surrounding Japan who are all trying to predict um, that uh, an earthquake is coming by measuring the movements of the earth. But we do need to realise in this prediction stage that there's often very little warning, even when using such devices as seismometers. And therefore, even with good predictions, sometimes you can have um, bad consequences from earthquakes, but people don't have very much time to respond to them. The next stage is preparation. This is where they are finding ways to reduce the impacts of a hazard. And in this case, an earthquake, we want to stop all that death. We want to stop all that destruction as best as possible. So as I showed you right at the start of the video, we can do that by designing clever buildings. So through the construction of buildings, and if you look at this top picture, they've got controlled um, weights on the roof that reduce the movement. You've got this steel cage that interlocks it, keeps everything protected in. Um, you've even got foundations that are in the, the clay that mean that it's really deep in the clay and that it doesn't move as much. Um, all of those are ways that building design um, can pre prepare um, the actual building from collapsing. Uh, but other ways can, can include education. And so this is um, a sign that's seen in most New Zealand um, classrooms. It tells you what to do. That reduces the, the impacts of this um, disaster because people know how to act when the disaster happens. They don't panic, so they go and drop, cover and hold under their desk. And that means if anything collapses, then it's less likely to hurt them than if they were running around screaming. So building design and education are just two examples of preparation. And I'll show you a couple of clips of that in action. So here's an example of a uh, bit of construction where it's earthquake proof. This is where they have shock absorbers that move around in the base of the building. So as the building, um, the, the earth moves, the building kind of moves with it, but doesn't fall over. 
Um, it's absorbing a lot of the pressure underneath it, but also um, it's sliding underneath and therefore the building doesn't collapse. So you can see the sliding motion happening there. Here's an example of education working very well. This lady gets a warning on her phone via text, which is another type of preparation where you get warning systems where people send out messages. And as you can see, everybody goes under the desks uh, in the, into that hold position because they know that they are going to be protected under there. So when the earthquake happens, when starts, things start to fall, the children and the teacher are protected. This is another example of the warning system. This is a message that is sent on TV. Um, it's in Japan. Um, an earthquake is just about to happen and the message has come through on TV. This gives people chance, maybe even a couple of seconds, to get under desks or get out of buildings. And as you can see, very quickly the earthquake happens. So this proves that there isn't a lot of time often um, to, to respond, but it can be sometimes the difference between life and death. One last way in which they help prepare um, to reduce the death and destruction in areas is to create something that we call hazard or risk maps, which is like this one on the left hand side. This is looking at uh, the San Francisco and uh, California area, and it's trying to show us where the areas would be um, damaged and affected the most when they're on this San Andreas fault. By mapping this using something called Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, we can therefore tell where we need to put the resources, where we need to put the most protective buildings, where we have to have the best preparation for the rest of it. And therefore, if we prepare in those areas the best, therefore we're um, going to have less impacts than if we did nothing at all. Um, it can also be used on areas where to predict where landslides are, and you often use um, satellites to help you do this. Um, so this is another way that you would use uh, preparation. If, uh, if something um, isn't prepared very well and you have an uh, unknown risk or hazard, you might also use this in what we call the long-term planning or appraisal stage as well. The next stage is the response, and this happens after the hazard. This is um, the first main stage of that, would what we call emergency response. And all the pictures in here all kind of respond to that. So first of all, you'd be trying to find people in an earthquake using search and rescue. These guys would um, could try and find people amongst the rubble and save them before um, they unfortunately die. They would then be taken to kind of field hospitals. So these are kind of temporary hospitals that would be set up to try and treat the victims who are injured. Um, you'd also then quickly after that, you'd have aid that would be given. So this could be given in the form of um, everything from blankets to food, often stuff that people wouldn't have because of most of their possessions would have been destroyed. And that would also include stuff like emergency shelters. So giving people homes to live in. These are all kind of the initial emergency responses that happen right after the earthquake has happened. The second bit of the response phase is uh, what we would um, be the longer term rebuilding. So if we look in this picture here, these... Um, Farmers uh, in, in Nepal are trying to like build back better, which is a strategy to try and make their homes much better constructed so that they don't unfortunately fall down again. That again is a, another response that happens after the event, but it happens not immediately. It might happen sometimes weeks and months. And often you'd have big organisations, you'd have governments, but you also have NGOs, so charities, and also big organisations like the World Bank would probably get involved to help out with such schemes. The last uh, final stage to consider is what we call the appraisal long-term planning stage. This is, again, very, very closely linked to the other stages. And essentially what it is, is where it's a kind of an inquest after the event, after the hazard, say an earthquake or tsunami or whatever it is. And what it will do, it will look and uh, see whether the disaster um, could have been prevented. Could there be more that could be done? Um, what needs to be changed to make sure that this event doesn't have the same effects again. Um, so it's essentially a big review of everything that went on. And what I mean by that, that can be looking at the, um, at the preparation stage. 
So it could be that what needs to be, do buildings need to be reinforced? Do we need to do more for each of the buildings? It could be into the prediction stage. Do we need um, kind of more um, size monitors or more size monitor stations? Do we need, uh, in the response team, do we need um, better training for our kind of emergency services? Was it just volunteers doing it or was it true professionals? Do we need um, to have better plans for where we put our field hospitals? Do we need to have more supplies? This often will be done by governments, but it can be also done by those big organisations, like I said before, like the World Bank. But this is where we look into what's happened and how can we make sure it doesn't happen again by making improvements to the various other stages?